In my family, we were named after saints and martyrs. My parents had a two-part master plan for the naming of children. Part A of the plan was to name us after the saint on whose feast day we were born. For reference, they consulted the daily missal as the due date dates drew near. Part B of the plan was that each of the girls' names include a form of Mary because of my mother's devotion to the Blessed Virgin. To become a saint, you have to do good deeds and perform miracles. To become a martyr, you have to die for your faith usually in a pretty awful way. It's said there are more than 10,000 saints recognized by the Catholic Church and countless numbers of martyrs. So there were lots of naming opportunities for our family. The plan was implemented in Ireland where their first child was born on the feast of St. Mary Magdalene. This baby was a boy, so there was no obvious naming opportunity here. But Mum looked ahead in the Missal and realized that it was the eve of the feast of St. Apollinaris, who was beaten to death in Ravenna, Italy, the only known martyr of that city. Although my firstborn brother ultimately did not receive this saint's name, he became, in a way, the only martyr of our family, for he died within 36 hours of birth from a defective heart that could not beat. He was christened Joseph Jerome Oliver after his father, his uncle, and the Joseph who lost his own firstborn son. The second child was also born in Ireland, arriving the following year on the feast of St. Malachy, the Archbishop of Armagh. He was born on a Monday, the day after All Souls Day. Since the Sunday Mass superseded the Mass of whichever feast happened to fall on that day, the Monday Mass was also said for the previous day's saint, who otherwise would have been overlooked Mass-wise. Who knew the plan would get so complicated? The Catholic nurses began to call the baby All Souls Judge, somewhat of a misnomer since he weighed nine and a half pounds, had pudgy cheeks, and looked like a boxer. He was baptized on the feast of St. Andrew Avellino, an Italian priest who died of apoplexy while saying mass. His name is invoked against a sudden death. Thankfully, there were no more of those. This baby was christened Andrew Joseph. two years later in Germany on the feast of Pope Pius V, who, among other things, excommunicated Elizabeth I and fired up the Spanish Inquisition. And nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. I was not named Pia, a fact for which I was very grateful during my bed wedding days, quite a bit later. Instead, I was named Maria, which was the German version of Mary, also the Portuguese, Italian, Spanish versions. And for a middle name, they added Siobhan. Unpronounceable, practically unspellable, and to the best of my knowledge, not even a saint. When we went back to the United States, I had lots of classmates named Mary. Mary Ann's, Mary Beth's, Mary Ellen's, and Maria Siobhan did not fit in. So I made her fit in. I told a first grade classmate that since I was born in Germany, Maria was German for Mary. And because we lived in Ireland before that, Siobhan was Irish for Jane. So my name was really Mary Jane. The next five children were all born in the same hospital, St. Joseph's in South Bend, Indiana, and delivered by the same obstetrician, Dr. Josephine Murray. Number four arrived two years later on the feast of St. Theodore the Hairy, 
a hermit who led an austere life in Thrace and was endowed with the gift of prophecy. The name didn't work for this baby girl, so she was christened Bridget Mara after that remarkable 5th century Irish woman who helped to Christianize Europe. Another St. Bridget, there were lots of St. Bridgets, was killed by barbarians in the 6th century, along with her sister Mara. The fifth child was born the following year on the feast of St. Cecilia, patron saint of music and one of the most venerated martyrs of the early church, who was both suffocated to death and beheaded in the bathroom of her own home. This child was christened Cecilia Mary, fulfilling both parts of the naming plan. Number six was born two years later on the feast of the 40 holy martyrs, Christian soldiers in lesser Armenia who froze to death on a pond for refusing to abandon their religion. Are you going to call this one 40 martyrs judge? Asked Dr. Murphy, who was familiar with the naming ritual by now. The martyrs names were never known, so mom and dad must have felt safe narrowing the 40 down to three and christening this child, Robert Thomas Patrick. Number seven was born two years later on the feast of St. Valentine, the Roman priest and physician who was beaten with clubs and beheaded in the year 269. Both parts of the plan again came together in perfect symmetry and she was named Valentina Marie. The eighth child was born the following year on the eve of the feast of St. Lawrence Justinian, venerated by the popes of his time and known for his writings on mystical contemplation. This birth date offered two naming options, so they chose Justin and added Philip as a middle name. Philip was, after all, one of the apostles and also a good Jesuit name, which resonated with mom, who had studied with the Jesuits at Boston College. The penultimate child was born a year and a half later on the feast of St. Arcadius, Tigrius, and Eutropius, all martyrs. Fortunately, he wasn't named after any of them, but instead after both his parents and was christened Jerome Francisco. Mum's middle name was Francis, and since he was born in Chile, Francisco was its Spanish translation. This seemed an appropriate choice since St. Francis of Assisi was known as Francesco, the Frenchman, because of his familiarity with that language. I don't believe our Jerome Francisco ever took up the French language or modeled his life after that of St. Francis, who spent his days in prayer, works of charity, and penance. However, the saint and his namesake did have one common trait, their affinity for four-legged creatures. Number 10 was born two years later on the same minor saint's day as Jerome Francisco. She was baptized on the Feast of Church Unity, whose patron saints were Peter and Paul, and therefore was christened Paula Antoinette after her grandmother and Marianne, because sometimes mom had to go to third place to effectuate part B of the master plan, but she always worked that Mary name in. If you didn't know where this child fell in the birth order, her birth announcement would lead you to believe she came towards the end. No more detailed information provided in mom's perfect Palmer method handwriting. No more date, weight, born on the solemnity of, just the picture and the name. In fact, the name must have been added years later because it's in Paula's handwriting. As to whether we lived up to our saintly namesakes, well, you be the judge of that after you've heard the rest of the stories.